For over 30 years, we've had the privilege to live and work in this great community. Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, representing accident victims across Northwest Florida. And now, from Pensacola, Florida, it's Within Reason with Bob Kerrigan and Bill Rankin. Well, good evening and welcome to Within Reason, Bob Kerrigan. And Bill Rankin. And we're glad that uh, you are with us. Now, before the show started, Mr. Rankin was telling me that he had some of the most marvelous material. He was so oh, excited about great. it. Yeah. Uh, I personally got a peek and it wasn't all that interesting to me, but he, he is uh, interested in giving it to you for your input and reaction and uh, just like just pass like this. This, this uh, the ball to you. In America, in our celebrity culture, celebrities can pretty much get away with anything without losing their appeal to the public. I mean, Willie Nelson was stoned his whole life and never paid any taxes and wound up with some enormous tax liability. It's all that Willie. <laughs> yeah. You know, they can beat up their spouses. They can ignore their kids. They can marry people they never met. They, they can just, just do about any immoral thing, and, and that's okay, except... They cannot be politically incorrect. Oh. Gilbert Gottfried. You know who Gilbert Gottfried is? I'm not sure. This guy, Gilbert Gottfried is a yeah. guy with a weird voice, and he is, and he is the voice, among other things, the voice of the Aflac duck. You know those annoying commercials? Aflac! Oh, I didn't know his name. Yeah, see, that was Gilbert Gottfried. Okay. So he made a poor joke about the Japanese during the tsunami. Just, you know, he tweeted some bad sure. taste jokes. Not, not too terrible. Yeah. They fired him. No. We cannot have the voice of the Affleck duck have the slightest moral stain in the area of political correctness. He's the voice of the duck. <laughs> now, if all he'd done was abandon his children, become an alcoholic, you know, or not pay his taxes, it was fine. just Gilbert. You can't say you the wrong thing. You cannot say, you cannot insult Don't you think it's Japanese. good, though? Don't you think it's, there's some good to this political oh, of correctness? Course. I mean, people used to use disparaging terms sure. for everybody. They talked like, and it was they wrong. talked like Rodney Dangerfield did, only in, in yeah. real life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there is, there is something bad, you know, when everybody refers to you, if you were a woman, as a chick, and, you know, it, it, no, it's, a, wait, it's a little a bit second. demeaning. Well, I don't mean that. That was one mistake. But, but I made one mistake. wires and to have taboos and magic yeah. words. Well, yeah. we can say that word, but you can't. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's crap. It's nonsense, you know. Uh, the, the chick thing, I apologized for two or three times. You keep you, bringing you it up. You apologized for that? I did What's a couple of weeks that? ago. Well, I, you just brought it up again. Well, you as know, an example of political I mean, correctness, yeah. the one thing I did, the one mistake. Do you talk about I the didn't brilliant insights? Do you talk about the marvelous preparation? Nothing. You talked about the chick. You brought the chick up. And you brought you got it up. an email about it. I, it, it. It didn't strike me as anything. I mean, you yeah. call this lady. Uh, immoral, a manipulator, and everything else. <laughs> nobody objected. You call her a chick. My God, that crosses the line. Yeah, that makes the point about political a, correctness. She was a socialite. She's a Republican she's socialite. A socialite. And she That's arranged certain socialite. events and certain How parties. does one become a socialite? Is there like a test or a I think course? if you can write a lascivious email to a four-star general, you qualify You could be a, so you could be a socialite. It. You could be a socialite. A socialite. And uh, make some handsome cash and have oh, some fun. Terrible. What a good job. Being a socialite. Being a socialite. Yeah. Wasn't that a marvelous job? Yeah. You think that because being I, a socialite pretty much puts you out of some nine to five grind oh, where you have no, to work. No, no, no. That, there's none of that. You work in the evenings, right? <laughs> Maybe all night. If it's an all night party, I haven't seen anything wrong with that. Could be an all night party. <sighs> See, okay. she you, you had some uh, insights from uh, Eisenhower that oh, you were talking okay. about. Do you have that? Well, yeah, it's, I do. That have would that. be a little more inspiring than where we are now, probably. So, what do you have? Well, you and know. by the way, for you that those of you who maybe just joined us. 
we're going to bash everybody tonight, okay? The $500,000 loan forgiveness people and you know, all the other stuff. It's all coming tonight. I mean, we're sparing nobody. If you're an elected public official, you may want to just turn the TV down or mute it now so that your spouse won't hear some of the things we have to say. So we're going to cover some of that tonight. But go ahead. On the uh, higher level now. Well, yeah. this is, this is I, I had this on my notes from some while ago. Uh, every, people are familiar with the famous Eisenhower speech about the military-industrial complex and, you know, letting the military run things. One, one of the things that that was was least understood or or least popularized about that speech, he said, the effect that militarization can have on kind of the psyche of the country, mm -hmm. you know, about constant preparedness for war and military and us and them and and uh, uh, attacking and so yeah. forth, and. It's true. I mean, all we see now, and there's nothing wrong with it, especially, especially for the frontline people who have, who endure awful hardships and take risks with their lives. But the, the celebration of war, you know, the, oh, the first person shooter games, the military people, and, and they even have this god awful thing on one of the TV channels, uh, Stars for Stripes, where the celebrities go out and pretend to. To do that, mm. and we have all this praise in the military stuff, and by God, we're going to kick their butt. Shock and awe mm -hmm. about the military, mm -hmm. and and it's just wrong, and it and it it's going to have some del deleterious effect. Good, you know, that we don't have we don't have, and and the the people who are, and there it has a lot of effects. I mean, one of these effects is we have these political generals, and the political generals are revered, and then then we wind up with things like we've seen with General Petraeus. And what people ought to be reminded of is how horrible all this stuff is. Yes. You know, um, you know who Wilfred Owen is? I don't. Wilfred Owen, this tremendous poetry came out of the First World War. Wilfred Owen was this great poet, and he, and he was a great person. I think he was the one who was killed like on the last day of the war. And he wrote this poem Dulce et decorum est, which is part of a saying, Dulce et, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is fitting and just to die for one's country. And I don't know, let me know. I mean, this poem would probably take four minutes to read, but it is so powerful. And I think it's a, just a great counterbalance to rah, rah, we got o, Osama bin Laden. Boy, they, they greased him, huh? <laughs> How about that? Yeah. And all the collateral damage and stuff. Well, we have following, um, I forgot exactly when it was passed. I want to say, I want to say during Jimmy Carter's administration, I'm not, the, the anti-assassination law where we yeah. can't go assassin, yeah. assassinate people. Um, but, it, but in essence, we do it. And yeah. now we're yeah. doing it with drones yeah. on a regular basis. Um, I, I, I do think and that we, we uh, yeah. go ahead. Well, yeah. Boy, that, that, there are two sides to that, though. I mean, finding these, some, some of these people, these sworn enemies of, of, of not just the United States, sworn enemies of civilization. Um, Might be the entire country of Egypt right now, but no. go ahead. But, <laughs> the, the you know, some of these, majority some of of these people, yeah. awful, well, Osama bin Laden. I sure. mean, I, it's, it's hard to say, well, we shouldn't have gotten him and killed him. Um, and 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 some of his underlings who are who are just horrible. I mean, they're they're the people who organized uh, setting off bombs in the middle of religious processions. Yes, you know, hiding in schools. The, the head of the Taliban. The Taliban's responsible for if little girls want to go to school, they throw acid at them. I mean, they're, they're just they're just beyond the pale. Bumping off those leaders, I don't know. I haven't have a, don't have an ethical analysis. It doesn't cause me a problem. But you're going back to war and. And the gl glamorizing of yeah. military conquests. And I, I've said this before, so I, I always quote myself, because not too many of the people that I can quote on this point, but that we have faced as a country the enormous guilt for the way we treated uh, the Vietnam veterans. I mean, just awful. Yeah. We treated them like dirt. Yeah, that was stupid. And the country itself is still trying to make up yeah. for that disparaging yeah. treatment of people who in 50,000 young men and women lost their lives in Vietnam. I mean, my goodness. And, and the country yeah. just didn't have any concern about it. You know, the crazy it. thing about it was a lot of those people were draftees. They were indeed They got drafted. 
They write to the call and went to war and they put a uniform and they come back and they baby killers and all, all of no, that. No, it was bad. I, I don't yeah. know how much of that actually went on. Well, I mean, my own experience, well, we, we flew into El Toro, which you couldn't, you know, a lot of the protesters couldn't, couldn't have gotten on that because it was a, a marine base. I don't know. Well, the, the reaction of the public now to the military is very alarming. Um, we, we respect our military as we respect our police yeah. officers and other people who help keep us safe and help the country protect the country from enemies of the country but this revering of everybody because they're wearing a uniform yeah. is really sending the yeah. wrong message to young people I think um, like wait just a second this is important and our country needs it but all of this, all of yeah, this deference yeah. that's being paid, and it's artificial. It's exactly. insincere. It's yeah. Yellow it's, ribbons it's on so, your car. It's so cheap and easy. It is cheap you know? and easy. Yeah. Well, no, my kids and my, my kids not volunteering for the service, but no. thank you for your service, and uh, you know we're you going to pay the, for your prosthetics. You institute the draft tomorrow, and we'll see how many people we have yeah. standing up and yeah. applauding. We're all happy about it. Or we ought to have a war tax. Our we war talked tax. about this before. Indeed, we yeah. don't have a war tax. We don't have a draft. You can avoid it. Just stand up a couple of times during the baseball game and be sure to take your hat off. Speaking of the okay. baseball game, ah. I would like, you have mentioned this several times. We don't exactly agree. Um, I don't think we disagree. Well, we may. Because <laughs> what I've said is yeah. the, the, the ballpark was well run. The ball games were a great experience. Since you didn't go to any, I don't think you can disagree with that. <laughs> well, it's hard to disagree with it, and, and thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> but but, but it, was, it was very well run, and yeah. the ball games were a great experience. And the it's stadium, it was amazing to me how cool the stadium stayed even in the, in the oh, summer evenings. It's, a, it's marvelous. It's a nice, nice place. It's a well, very it's, expensive, well-designed say, place. Let's say this. It's the finest double-A baseball park that's ever been built. Yeah, well, There's yeah. none better. $58 million. And in $58 million, they didn't quite have enough money to put in things to make popcorn. They didn't reserve enough money to put in, like, stuff in the kitchen. Really? No, no. I didn't know that. 50, I thought that was in the back in the oh, atrium. Oh, no, no, no. That's $58 million, and they didn't quite, weren't quite able to finish the kitchen, so they made a deal with a tenant that if you'll give us some pots and pans money to finish this up, we'll give you the concessions. Oh, that's how that Yeah, that was about. a good deal. It was a good deal. Oh, okay? my gosh. Oh, there's another thing, too. For the $58 million, and these are ballpark numbers. I'd love for somebody to call and tell us actually it's more or less. This was supposed to be a multi-use facility. Well, everybody knows going back, it's supposed to be a museum. Right. It's supposed to be University of West Florida. It's supposed the to have retail shops. Retail. And, and the baseball park was a small part of the overall complex. It is now the complex, plus the out parcels for buildings, but it is the complex. When they built it, remember it was going to be this multi-use stadium facility. Well, after they spent $58 million, guess what they found out? They didn't have enough money to build a cheap amphitheater. Right. So? Or to finish it they, out. They yeah. found, no, to build it. Even to build it. They to build to, They had to borrow that money. They had to, well, they got a donation so, from a very generous benefactor, uh -huh. which we won't mention, but everybody knows these folks are very generous people in our community. So they gave a million dollars. It's Skip and Martha Hunter. So they mm -hmm. gave a million dollars to, to build the amphitheater. But guess what? In the 58 million, they didn't have quite enough money to build any kind of support facilities for mm -hmm. the amphitheater, so they had to borrow $500,000 from another government agency, mm -hmm. really borrowed it from the city, to put well, in So there. this is the, the C, Community, Community Maritime Park Association, right? which is separate from the CRA. Correct. Community, yeah, right. and but, which yeah. is separate from the city, kind of. Kind of. The CRA is a geographical area in which a certain amount of money is collected from ad valorem taxes. We'll just say approximately $3 million, because that's approximately correct. And that $3 million is to be used within this development area downtown. Well, the $3 million, as it turns out, is now going to be largely consumed by debt obligations. Right. So you have this problem. You have an organization called the CRA, for which the board of directors or the officers or whatever are the city council, it's the same people. But you have the CRA. Actually, the CRA couldn't 
support this kind of debt. So the city of Pensacola had to actually incur the debt. The city of Pensacola incurs the debt, and they build a stadium. But, Bill, nobody ever said this. Now, I wonder how much we can rent it for, because that would dictate how much you would spend to build right. it. And you say, well, if we can only rent it for two bucks a day, then you're not going to build a $2 million facility. Okay? That's well, not they the never, way government thinks. Well, the government, government doesn't think that way. And these, none of these people thought about much other than we're going to get this thing built. So at the end of the road here, they spent all this money and then threw in a million and a half from two sources, one private donation, another borrowed $500,000 to build something that the public can actually use for, you know, concerts and things like that. So, where are we now? Well, we had a request that the, the Community Maritime Park Association... And doesn't have any money, and there are very little money. Reason they wanted they, to forgive the loan. Well, the reason they have very little money is they, that they struck long before some of the people that are on there now, admittedly, particularly the, the head guy. Long before that, they struck a very, very bad deal with a tenant that owns the Blue Wahoos. So this tenant is paying what would any reasonable person would consider a nominal amount, a nominal amount of rent for this huge facility, for this 60, 58, $60 million facility, paying a nominal amount of rent to use it. So they don't have enough money, and the CMPA gets all their money from a tenant, okay? And right. a little advertising and other stuff, so they don't have enough money. So they have 500000 They claim they told everybody from the get-go that they probably weren't going to have any money. They don't have any money, so they made this request to forgive a $500,000 loan. Well, what does that mean? It means that the taxpayers are being said, sent, here's the bill. Right. You, mom and pop taxpayer, you're going to pay $500,000 because of the level of mistakes that were made at every level from the, from the day they decided to abandon the overall concept that the taxpayers approved and build a baseball park. So now we're back to this. We started this. In fairness, the tenant who has the base has a franchise. By the way, he owns the Blue Wahoos. We don't. Taxpayers don't own it. They're a privately owned investment that he has. Runs his baseball thing and did a good job. And you said it. Yeah. Right? Oh, every, everybody said it. And did and a great job. I've, I've never heard any dissent. It's, it's nicely run and it's a good experience. And I highly recommend it. It's fun. Highly recommend it. Here's the problem. That entity, the CMPA, and their tenant who has the baseball part, has the baseball franchise, they sit over here and they get a little money from this, for the CMPA and money for him and they share different deals and it's, that's fine. And, and, and the CMPA doesn't need much money to survive, maybe a million a year or so, and they, they got their own little deal going. Here's the problem. Over here sits us, the taxpayers, and we're sitting here with a bill, okay, that's going to be what one no. of our esteemed writers has said, over $80 million for the repay. But we're sitting over here with all the debt obligation, and these people over here who are running the baseball park and their tenant, they don't have anything to do with the debt. They don't have any obligation to pay the debt. And honestly, as far as the tenant's concerned and everybody else, they probably don't really care if the debt gets paid because if the debt is not paid... It doesn't, affect, it doesn't affect well, them. It affects the city. Isn't that always the way it is with a tenant? I mean, if you, if, if you rent an, a, an apartment in an apartment house, you neither know nor care how much the owner owes on the debt. This is, this is your rent. You pay your rent, and then you have the occupancy, but and it, the tenant the, pays rent. But now, here, the tenant got an extraordinarily good deal in this case. Here's the difference. We are paying for it as taxpayers. This right. is not a private builder that owns a building or an apartment building. This is the government. This is our right. government has created this financial burden for all of us. And by the way, exhausted our borrowing capabilities with this debt, including the $20 million it's going to take to repay move in this sewer plant. So the combination of those two things exhausts our borrowing power through the city of the CRA. So we don't have, we can't do anything we have, we have put all of our marbles into this basket, Bill, and that is to the baseball park. Now, I'll just ask you, if I said to you, I'm going to give you, personally, just you, 
to, to preside over this for the benefit mm -hmm. of, the, of the city, $60 million to improve the city of Pensacola. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what could be done with that kind of money? I mean, just across the board. Yeah, in the city terms of Pensacola is not that big. And the city's lot. not, you could have underground utilities, you could have an enhanced uh, historic district. All of these things would have fostered economic development. Point. Yeah, so we put all our eggs in this basket. Why? Why did we do that? Why did we get to this point where the tail was wagging the dog? And I do think the tail is wagging the yeah. dog now. And what we've seen well, with this 500,000 is the beginning of a long series of problems. There's, there's, there's no question that the, the ballpark is, is, a, is a big financial problem for the city. Right, and maybe, fifty-eight million. That's that's over a thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child in the city of Pensacola. That's there's, right. That's what you owe now. That's what we now, owe. Now maybe you won't necessarily have to pay it if you move out, you know, or maybe your kids will pay it if they stick around. Somebody's going to pay it. When we come back, we are going to continue this discussion as this problem impacts our community in downtown Pensacola. We'll be back after this short break. For over 30 years, we've had the privilege to live and work in this great community. Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, representing accident victims across Northwest Florida. I will continue our discussion. Uh, Bill made a couple of good points. Um, during the break, why don't you? Well, crank we, them up. we 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 were going to talk about what what is the effect of the baseball park. We've heard complaints that well, people come to the baseball park and it's and, and, and there's only so many dollars. Most of the people at the baseball park are local people. Of course, people are coming from distant places or they're visiting, but most of the people are Escambia, Santa Rosa County. You you just you just got to assume that they're not they're not coming great distances. And one argument is, well, there is a very limited amount of entertainment dollars. And if you go to the ballpark and you buy hot dogs and, and all of that, the prices to get into the ballpark aren't high. The prices for the concessions are not cheap, but uh, not, not, not major league standards. But if you're on a limited entertainment budget, you might blow that at the ballpark and not go to a restaurant. That's one argument. Another argument is, the, it, it, it is such a nice attraction that some people trying to decide whether to relocate themselves or their business, or, you know, there's city A, B, C. Well, I really like Pensacola because that yes. ballpark is really fun. In fact, I'm looking forward to the baseball season because I'm one of the many people who really enjoys going to baseball games. I think it's a good point. It could have a positive economic effect. And... and we hope it does. How could you not hope it, it will be positive for the community? What kind of person is be, be wishing for doom and gloom? It, it's just that it needs to be objectively evaluated. And one of the things that we hope we can do in the course of this program is to talk about, well, who made all the money? Who got the fees? Um, consultant fees, processing fees, loan application fees, loan fees, new market tax credit fees, um, these fees. Um, they blew two and a half million dollars on an incompetent developer. Yeah. I mean, so there's so much money that was wasted here that we as, as taxpayers, and we ought not to just say, well, okay, let's move on. Let's move on. It's, it's, too, it's too bad. Let's move on. No, no, we're not going to move on. I don't think we should move on. We should know. How did the city council fall asleep during this entire process. What was the city manager doing during this entire process where this thing just went downhill like 90 miles an hour? The city council directly got involved in micromanaging and screwed around hiring this developer. They did it. They're responsible for it. Well, well, what did it cost us? Well, the answer is, I think, it's in the millions and millions of dollars. And I'm back to this. We've spent, we put all of our eggs in this basket. 
for economic development downtown. I'm, you're talking about all your, all your borrowing power. Everything was committed to this. But nobody started off saying, you know, we're going to commit every dime we can to this economic development project. It didn't, it didn't do that. It just kind of grew. And other people kind of pitched in. And they had constantly had, it was musical chairs. You had different people involved, different people getting fired, and on and on and on and on. We ended up with this marvelous facility. Now the question is, truly, what's going to happen? You could have built a baseball park for less, for sure. And a lot of this cost down there was remediation of the site, you know, because mm -hmm. of the pollution, I mean, yeah. the pollution through the years. So the site had to be remediated. That's where a lot of the money went, or a good part, part of the money went. We want to be fair about it. But I do think that the subject deserves a continuous discussion because the day of reckoning is coming on this ballpark. And as a community, we need more and more citizens informed, and we need less and less blue sky from the people who are benefiting by this short term. We, we need hard questions being asked by informed people, and we hope to accomplish some of that, and to be fair about it, hopefully. And, and I think the overarching thing about a lot of this, and one of the reasons I'm so much in favor of smaller government is government does all kinds of things that sound good. Well, we're going to, here's a poor area, and what we're going to do is we're going to put money into the poor area so it can be developed, so there'll be jobs for poor people, and people's lives will be better. And there are so many ways to game those things. There are. Well, Indeed. we're going to put my little space inside. This is a politician. This is going to be inside the poor area, and then I'm going to get all kinds of tax breaks for me because I'm living in a poor area. Or... Like you said, some of the some of the fees that go to people doing bonds and and those this is other a fee, things. This is a feast better than the best Thanksgiving anybody could imagine in this business. And that is tons of fees. When we get the final fee numbers, we're going to post them on our website and we'll cover them on the air. Who got all this money? Because every penny that goes out in fees, some of it's required. Okay, you have registration fees, issuance, well, bond you can't, issuance yeah, you fees. You can't issue bonds yeah. without incurring you, you, costs. You've got, to, you've got to pay costs, but these are very expensive propositions to issue bonds and create d debt this way for purposes of construction. And so you lose a lot of money from the cap of your debt to the disposable use of the funds. There's a big, big margin there. And the question is, who got all that money? And we ought to know as, yeah. as a community. Was well, there an alternative? Who's paying attention to it? Who was paying because attention to it? Because in politics, a lot of times, they, 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 they care, not all politicians, and, and certainly I don't think the city council is necessarily any worse than anybody else, but a lot of times you see so-and-so's friend got this really lucrative deal, and you wonder if they're, who they're looking out for. It's a problem with government. doesn't... You know, I've um, traveled some in, in some countries where corruption is pervasive. Oh. I've talked with people about the corruption in their countries, and they're well aware of the pervasive nature of corruption. And corruption is pervasive because it's in, endemic to human nature. And this, in this country, it's a little bit more uh, subtle and a yeah. little more concealed. It is. And not as quite as overt handing somebody five bucks to, you know, get your your ticket fixed or whatever. Here we're much more sophisticated, but we're the same human race and we have pervasive corruption and it finds its way in and out of government because there's so much money. That's what kills me about these conservative businessmen. They're the first ones in line for government deals, oh. government contracts, government benefits. They're the first ones and then they want to scream and holler about how there's conservative they are. tons of corporate welfare, all kind of corporate welfare. It's a good book yeah. that's just been written. Oh, it's The Subsidizing of America. I, huh. I, 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 I say good book. I heard a summary of it, and then I read um, a brief recap uh -huh. of the book. We'll, we'll cover that again, The Subsidizing, subsidizing of America, everything. that talks about all of the areas in which uh, corporations have gamed the system. What you were talking yeah. about earlier. Yeah, to, to, yeah. To, it happens all the time. To get, to get the it, money. It's everywhere. Yeah, yeah it is. I mean, the, 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 the ethanol subsidy, the, the farm subsidies, handing out loads of money to people to grow or not grow crops. Well, I mean, what, why don't we have a free market in that area? It's why interesting. Just... The people who are the, the entrepreneurs or the self-claimed entrepreneurs and the, and the uh, free enterprise people, 
they, a lot of them, not a terrible generalization, but a lot of them are quite quick to get in the government line, okay? <laughs> With you whatever bet. their government deal is, their special tax deal, their special benefits, their inside deals on contracts. I mean, it's disgusting. It's like, d don't tell us how conservative you are. Just spare us that, yeah. okay? You can yeah. say whatever yeah. else you are, but don't tell us you're conservative and that you believe in the free enterprise system and uh, smaller government. And it all what? sounds so good, it sounds doesn't it? Great. Clean energy. We need to invest in clean energy. Now, who could be against that? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great <laughs> idea. The, some of the corruption surrounding that, and it goes right to the Obama administration, is abominable. That's a valid, valid point. You've made it before, and I've agreed with it. I think yeah. it... Uh, How about this? The, yeah. a, a couple of the auto magazines made the Tesla. Tesla came out with a big sedan that's a pure electric car. It's a beautiful car. And they have different prices dependent upon it's this, it's this great big, it's got this very fluid, almost voluptuous design. Because you can you have more design choices I've when you have it. an electric car. I've, I've, seen the, the, I've seen the coupe. It's beautiful. The small one. No, the, the, the little one was, the little one. The little no. one was just based, that was kind of based on, on a, a Lotus car. This is a design from scratch car. Mm. And it is a beautiful car. And, and they've, they've made some great design breakthroughs. It's just that the market really can't support it right now. So every time a rich person, and you've got to be pretty well off to buy one of these, they're like 100 grand. Every time somebody buys one, the government helps out with $7,500. I think it's nice. <laughs> it's nice. nice. A little, ben a little yeah. benefit. Yeah. You know, you everybody some, should get a little gonna, bit. This car would cost $107,500, but the government's going to kick in a little bit to help you out with it. But that's fair because the rich people need a break, too. The, I'm giving you the Republican argument because the poor people are getting the Chevy Volt kickback, right? Yeah, the Chevy Volt isn't. Sure, we both got. Yeah, I mean, they're getting the seventy five hundred though, right? The argument is yeah. that we got to kind of prime the pump, you know, when we get these things going, and they have made great breakthroughs in lots of ways. They have. I mean, yeah. this Tesla is a very impressive car. The trouble yeah. is, there's something galling about people who have to be pretty well off paying a hundred grand for a car. We're helping them with seventy five hundred dollars. You're coming around, you know, really. Well, your your negative uh, wealthy stuff, I like. I think you yeah. you may but be. But then you've got. Well, well, let's oh, go to the back. other side of that equation. You're, you're backing up. Tax a breaks for the rich. Yeah, well, lots of them. Tax breaks for the rich. <laughs> Obama has lots, has lots of tax breaks. Yeah, has repeated that so many times. People believe it. I do too myself. Tax breaks for the rich? Oh, I think so, yeah. Here's, here, here is the yeah. truth of the matter. 2001 and 2003, there were Bush tax cuts. The, the effect of the Bush tax cuts were the taxes in, in all the brackets went down. About everybody got a tax cut. Yes. It's just lowering the rates. That's it's true. It's a tax cut. It's not a break. And everybody still got that tax cut. But... Obama wants to just let that expire for the wealthy, but and he labels that now a tax break. They're taking advantage of tax breaks. It's not a tax break. It's a rate that's lower than it was before. But that's just political talk. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a bunch of crap. It's a but. It's a but a now let's see how it works in action. Okay. The o Obama uh, uh, drones were out. The ACLU had a bunch of people out with signs. And many of these people could probably read the signs. <laughs> no, wait, and this way, I'm going to make sure I got these titles right. The ACLU people are drones. No, I mean, no, oh. AFL CIO. Oh, oh, the union yeah. people. Yeah. All the union people were out. All union people are They're drones. They're out there. They, well, some all of them are. Some, some of the ones with the signs are union drones. They had signs. That, yeah. Uh, they're, they were picketing. This is on the front page of the PNJ. Yeah. Picketing Jeff Miller saying, don't touch our Social Security. Don't touch our Medicare. And, and, and in order to pay for tax breaks for the rich. Yeah. And I, you're just dying to go talk to people and say, which tax breaks are you talking about? Uh, tax breaks for the rich. Oh, President Obama said it. Tax breaks well, for the rich. Well, if you say it enough times, people start to get yeah. it. And see, it's too, oh, com it's too complicated to talk about um, nuanced, esoteric uh, uh, loopholes. So you yeah. just talk about tax breaks for the rich, right. and it kind of includes right. tax rates, and you know, and it's is, pretty easy. I it's mean, easy. He's going to whack away at the top two yeah. percent. Now, if you took all the money from the top two percent, you you couldn't you couldn't handle the deficit. No, really. I mean, help. it's crazy. It would it would certainly be some some help, some it'd noticeable be, and substantial help. Yeah. help. Yeah. But. What, what's getting lost in this? So it's so easy for an Obama. These people aren't voting for Obama anyway, except the Hollywood celebrities who don't have a lick of sense. <laughs> they're not voting for him anyway, and they're going to vote for Obama no matter Nobody what. in Hollywood? Nobody oh. with any sense <laughs> oh, okay, good. in that tax break would, would vote for Obama, it, it seems to me. Nobody in what tax break? In the, in the upper two tax... They in, all voted for Obama. Nobody <laughs> with any sense... Oh. 
among the people he was labeling as selfish. Okay. Not paying your share. You're not paying your share. He was kind of mad about it. He said, <laughs> so, you know, you, you didn't build that. You think you're so smart. There are lots of people who are smart. You've yeah. got a lot of money, and it's really kind of everybody's money, and we're all in this together, <laughs> this flawed concept that we've talked about before. Now, what gets lost in this is with a little political courage, mm -hmm. you, could, you could do things that the economists say are good and, and lower... You'd raise more taxes. A lot of people would pay more taxes, yeah. but you could lower the highest marginal tax rate. How about this? They won't touch. Obama is afraid to touch the home mortgage interest deduction, even insofar as it applies to your second home. You have a home mortgage interest deduction for that. That's because of the, the time-honored profession of real estate. Right. Uh huh. There are so many. We're going to do a special after the first of the year on misleading jargon and jingo from real estate agents, including advertisements about cute and cozy, which usually yeah. means a near disaster that can't, needs to be demolished. Yeah. All right, now but I want to ask you a question is, about that. A lot, of these, a lot of these tax deductions just don't make a lick of sense, and they should be they eliminated. Should be. They're just gimmicks in the tax code. Let's clean it up. And another thing. If, if he's successful, the only thing he wants to do is raise the tax rate on the upper 2%. He's going to spend more. This isn't going toward the deficit. He's talking about actually more spending. I agree. Nancy Pelosi, agree. we've already cut a trillion dollars. Here's the cut. They have projected a slowing in the rate of increase, which only in Washington is a cut. <laughs> I agree with really, that. Really, it's just nonsense. Why do you always mention anything? Nancy Pelosi? You make me defend her position. No, you don't have to defend her. I mean, if I remain silent, it looks like Nancy I agree. Nancy Pelosi is a wretched person, <laughs> and most of the policies she espouses make no sense for the country. It was you could agree to that. Well, I don't care for her. Because I think she's the worst thing that could possibly happen to the Democratic Party. But I want to ask you this question. This is going to embarrass you now. I'm telling you, because I've got facts now that are just going to okay. knock you down. Let's have it. All, All right. right. <laughs> Did you believe that the government was right in the AIG bailout? No. Ah. Why? Why was the government not right in the AIG bailout? Yeah. Because what, these bailouts were, were contrary to the way the free market works. Okay. What Let if, it happen. What if I told you this? The government made money on it. You got it. Right. The well, government made money on the bailout and your way, saved the economy. And Obama was the person that did it. Tease your way through Obama. the accounting. Huh? Tease your way through the accounting. And it doesn't always work out that way. Well, I'll you tell know? you this. They booked a profit. The United States government booked a $30 million profit on the sale of AIG stock. Now, was it a great deal for the government? No, but the government interceded when they had to. You know, if the AIG... Yeah, AIG... If the, if the AIG the, blocked... The failure apart, was... Oh, my gosh. AIG was writing insurance policies without anything to back it up. And, and the regulators let them do it. They let them do that it. That was the problem. Yeah. They were... They were basically insuring all of these uh, collateral mortgage obligation deals. They were, and they and could hardly wait to do it. And then, yeah. Michael, what's his name? Mike, to back and, it up. Guy Lewis, he was selling them short. Yeah. I mean, or, yeah. or buying yeah. their short position over and over and over again. The Big Short, a great book and talk about. But the point is, Obama saved the car industry, and he saved AIG. So, okay. okay. Obama did not save the car industry. General Motors went bankrupt. It was a political bankruptcy. It should have been a legal bankruptcy. The result would have been pretty much the same, except the unions wouldn't own the company. Somebody else would own the company. Maybe well, the shareholders would own the company. Well, the actual I, shareholders are paid for shares. I think the bondholders got screwed. I the bondholders got screwed. Yeah. The union got benefited. Yeah. The, the result would have been the same. They said, oh, if we let it go to bankruptcy, all, all, of, the, all of the vendors, all the people who sold you, they all would have gone bankrupt. It, it was a prepackaged bankruptcy. You can do that. The government... There are arguments either way, and nobody can be 100% sure, and I'm no. less than sure but you're giving about me, this. Are you giving me AIG today? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got AIG. So the government, so the government yeah. makes a bad bet 
and some of the bad bets pay off. So if the government <laughs> makes a right. bet, when it pays off, they come out even. <laughs> when it doesn't pay off, the taxpayers really get screwed. So th that doesn't mean the overall scheme is any good. You agree with me, though. They had to do something about AIG because the rippling effect inter I, internationally could have been disastrous. I wish I knew more about it. Yeah, well, AIG, AIG is not just a little... Who AIG was, was big, and they were... They were too big to fail, truthfully. Yeah. They were insuring these instruments, yeah. and they had nothing to back it up. Well, George W. said they're too big, and his, here's a great quote, too big to fail. Here's his great quote, this sucker could go down. <laughs> that was his view. Right. And it wasn't too he far. He might have been right. He wasn't too far off uh, to, yeah. to, to fail. So, yeah. so we got AIG, good investment for the government, got a nice return on that. Yeah. And it kind of kills your whole argument. $30 billion, which is yeah. what? Yeah. I mean, how long would that keep the government going? I, actually, I don't think it was thirty billion. I Wasn't it was, that much? I thought it was thirty million. Thirty million. <laughs> it was a modest return. Thirty million. That wouldn't keep the government going for thirty seconds. Well, I mean, on the stock sale, I think. Why are we, we spending ten yeah. billion a day? This government. No, no, right? I'm talking about the stock benefit oh, to the only government. Oh, was thirty million. I think it was thirty million, thirty-one million. I believe that's the number. I just got that from uh, from the. Uh, when we come back, we're going to take a short break. Now, we're going to talk about credit unions. We have a major credit union facility in Pensacola. They're so friendly. And You're going to bash them? We will let you find out when we come back. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be back here in just a minute. For over 30 years, we've had the privilege to live and work in this great community. Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, representing accident victims across Northwest Florida. Okay, we're, we're back. We were just talking on the break. Um, about uh, the hiring of Randy Oliver, but and we have a comment too. But uh, you're going to talk about credit unions, though. Oh, we'll talk about credit unions but near the end of the show. But let's we'll say that because we don't want to have anybody of any time to respond to that. You know, I mean, you. I mean, I want to just. No, I. I. You know, I, I feel the way you do. Oh, about you do. It. Yeah. Well, here's. I, well, let's talk about credit unions now, and then we'll go to Mr. Oliver in a minute. But on, on credit unions, here's the problem. First of all, they started out. And in a very narrow um, yeah. clientele, you had sure. uh, Eglin Federal Credit right. Union, and you had, uh, um, you know, the the whatever credit people union in a enough. business yeah, the could get together and pool the, some money oh. and loan the money to each other, and and they didn't they didn't have to pay taxes and they didn't have to do all the things yeah. a bank would do because right. they were just a bunch of people kind of pooling their money, people who were associated with each other. Yeah, exactly right, and so. It developed that they became very successful because they didn't have to pay taxes that all of our local banks pay, okay? So credit unions don't pay taxes. That's, that's a big problem. But aren't they, aren't they just limited to the, you know, the, the well, small group and not I think, exactly? I think if you have two eyes and you can walk, you can join. You, there are credit unions you yeah. can join if you live in the county. If you live in Escambia County, you can be a member of this credit union. There's, there are credit unions you can join. I don't care who you are. You can figure out a way to join a credit union. And so the, the, the problem is they compete with local banks. Right. Unfairly. They can beat them on interest rates. They can do other things. And every year in the Congress, there's this big fight. Hey, you no longer are a small group of people that are helping each other. You are a massive business with a huge lobby, and you don't want to pay taxes. So let's just talk about fair share. If we had credit unions contributing, paying taxes that banks pay, that would be a huge revenue that source would help, wouldn't it? in this country. Yeah. yeah. Talk about f paying your fair Freebies. share. Why do credit unions not have to pay? You probably don't want to hear about churches. 
The, not right now. No. Okay. <laughs> but, but anyway, on credit unions, are we glad the big credit union here at Navy Federal? Of course, of course we are. They're a great employer. If we're going to have a credit union centrally located, this is a wonderful community to be located in. But the truth is, the bigger issue is that we uh, have an unfair tax situation for our local yeah. banks. It's tough for our local banks, and they're so overregulated anyway now. Yeah. It's, it's if you want to borrow money for a, for a car, you, you get a better rate at a credit union. You do. And if you don't have to pay taxes, yeah, you can you can do all right if you don't have to pay taxes. Advantage. It's one of the reasons Amazon.com is so popular. It you know? is, yeah. Most of the time, you're not being charged tax on what you're buying. That's just simple sales tax, yeah, and exactly yeah. right. They're not paying. All right, now let's talk about Randy Oliver for just a minute, okay? Yeah. You had a comment a about uh, his his work with the commission and then what happened to him. Well, Ra Randy Oliver had these these very varied. Uh, Reviews by the county commissioners. Some liked him, but some of the county commissioners really didn't like him because Randy Oliver didn't support them in certain things or did things that uh, they then. And, and Rick Outson had a pretty good analysis of what Randy Oliver did, which was kind of blow the whistle on something that sounded illegal, which really kind of got him crosswise with one or more of our esteemed long term county commissioners. So Randy Oliver got fired basically by the county commission. And he has wonderful academic and experience qualification. We were lucky to get him to come here. So, so here's, can you imagine now, if you're bright enough to be hired as the county commissioner, you're too, I mean, as the county administrator, you're too bright to accept the job. Exactly. <laughs> Who are they going to get? This is for Bob Smith. Who are they going to get? Are you going to work? want to work for these clowns? That if you, you know, if you're doing your job and you're looking out for the taxpayer, but you, you, because the way the county commissioners see the job, the county administrator is, going, is a lap dog and has to do whatever they want. Which is uh, a form of government because of these single member districts. You know, we haven't yeah. talked much about this here, but it goes back to many, many years ago, federal court decisions saying because your minority population isn't adequately represented, you have to elect people by districts. And it's an archaic form of government. We need to have five commissioners elected countywide. Now, think about this. These five commissioners, and we'll talk about Randy Oliver, finish that in just a second, but these five commissioners um, each have a chunk of money from the local option sales tax. And so each they one's, have to spend. They, they're going to spend it in their districts. And it doesn't matter that they're going to build an equestrian farm that nobody uses or whatever they want to do because they get to do it because it's in their district. Whereas if you were thinking about how do we make Pensacola explode with the potential that this place has, you would be putting an enormous amount of that $25 million local option sales tax money that's allocated into the lower part of the county. You just would. I mean, th th this is a thriving potential waterfront community in the south. I mean, are you kidding me? So we're going to build an equestrian farm and then we're going to build something on the west side in a swamp as a baseball park to appease Valentino's people. So, so why would you do all of that if, if, you, if you were interested in the county as a whole? They're not. They're, they're, they're interested in their five districts, which is so sad because the money is being spent in a way that's not the best for the greater community, the greater Pensacola, Escambia County community is not being spent that way. Exactly. Early on in this show, and, and, and we, Bob and I both think the world of, of Grover Robertson. We and do. He, he is, he's, he's a good public official. He's a bright guy. He's, he's working for the benefit of the citizens. But we started talking about the Roger Scott Tennis Center, which got upgraded to the tune of over a million dollars with soft courts and all that stuff. And they were at, at one time, they were in competition with a local business that paid property tax, the Pensacola Racquet Club, which went out of business. Now, is there a direct relationship? Maybe, maybe not. And he actually called into the show. That was back when we were taking calls. We no longer care to hear from you. Uh, and said, well, I had this money to spend. I had to spend it in the district. Well, that's one way to look at it. And Grover is the best of them. I mean, we think well, he's Grover very, is my county commissioner. Yeah. I think the world of him. He's very conscientious. He's a, he's a good guy. He's honest. Very smart. And thank goodness. And I, I really like our two new commissioners. I really do. I think they are going to be great if they get out from under the wing 
<coughs> of the Valentine. If they can kind yeah. of get, you know, get over here from, from him yeah. and from Robertson, we have a chance to have three commissioners that really can get this county back. Let's go back with Randy Oliver because this is where we started. So here's a great guy. I don't go overboard, but he's eminently qualified. He's, he's a great guy. I've dealt with him and talked to him. He seems very personable. He's very intelligent and was doing a good job. And now we've got, as we started this program, talking about this fiscal, potential fiscal bat problem with this community maritime park thing. So the mayor has consulted yeah. with Randy Oliver and hired him yeah. as a consultant. See, Randy, so Randy Oliver gets fired for some reason, a personality clash with the county commissioners to put it in a good light. And but he's so kind. The, 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 the city basically hired him at five grand a month. Is it a six just as a consultant? Yeah, to yeah, come he's a in. And he's going to focus on delivering to the public, <laughs> hopefully, a true and accurate account of where have we been with 60 million, 58, 60 million, whatever the final number is. Where are we? Where are we on these tax credits? What kind of organizational structure? demands that you create an independent government like the CMPA that's responsible to nobody, in essence, that has no interest in preserving or protecting or rather paying down the debt and say that they're indifferent to the debt. And you have a tenant that's indifferent to the debt that's created the facility. You have a discounted rent going on. So, what, so, so what's the fiscal impact? We need to know as a community. Well, we need we to really know. What we really need is, yeah. is is there a remedy? And and there are some things that will ameliorate the situation. I mean, if they can if they can put some more businesses onto that land, and they are builders, students building a very expensive build, office building over there. Uh, it, it will help if they build some buildings there. It's not going to come anywhere near providing the increase in ad valorem taxes that are needed to support this massive debt. It's not, it's not going to happen. There's no economist that will say, oh, this is a really good business plan. You're oh, really going to it'll attract so many new things because, of course, this Yeah, it, it, your ad valorem tax is a function of the assessed value of these new buildings. So, yes, you get some new buildings. Yes, you get, you, there's delays, of course, years of delay. And you finally get a building built and you get you get it assessed and they start paying taxes. They're going to pay ad valorem taxes on and, that. And lease fees. Yeah, yeah I they mean, pay both. lease fees. Yeah, they're, they're going to pay both. I think I they do. I think they pay, I think they pay, uh, that's a good point. I think they pay ad valorem. Because the land is, a, is public land. Of course. I think they pay ad, they pay a lease and I think they pay ad valorem tax based on the, on the structure that's on the land. I think that's that how would that be, works. That would be fair. But they also thought that there would be more buildings built downtown, more you know, improvement in, yeah. the, in that. I would, I would add to the ad valorem tax uh, base. And, and hopefully that'll happen. But it's so far out in the future. The question is, what's going to happen to the debt? There's something going on here that we still don't have a grip on. And that's this. My understanding of the debt, the current structure of the debt, is that the bond, annual bond payment, it purportedly is a million eight seventy-five or a million eight seven fifty. Yet it doesn't make any sense that the term of the bonds and the total interest, when you calculate that, it suggests that the bond payment should be a lot higher. I'm not sure why, but one of the things that we hope will come out of these discussions is a, a layperson's understanding of the structure of this deal and how much money is going to be needed to repay the bonded debt annually. We, I don't think we have a good grip on that. I have some numbers about that a million three for the sewer plant re relocation, a million eight seven fifty for the first three or four years of the bond, but bonded debt. But my understanding is that's not going to amortize out. That's not going to work to pay off the bonded debt. So we'll find out more about that, hopefully from Randy as he yeah, looks into yeah. it. Well, the mayor has been able to surround himself with some pretty good people. To his credit, he keeps yeah. going out and finding outstanding yeah. people to help him. It's, it's, a, it's such an improvement. You know, when we have, when you think what's happened in the city of Pensacola, and it's, it's, it's not just Ashton, but I think we've, I think our city council's coming around too. We're so proud of PC Wu, and and I think that there's a, a level of maturity in all here, uh, in leadership that the city is really doing remarkably well. The county is not, yeah. and it's 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 very 
unfortunate that we're in this position. But maybe with these three new commissioners, I mean, two new commissioners with Grover's well, leadership, we so. yeah, I hope, yeah. I think it'll make a difference. Be because, because what we've got, if, you know, whenever, whenever they do these studies and you look at the statistics, we're, we, we've got a terrible dropout rate in our public schools. We're not very healthy. We've got loads and loads of crime. I mean, we're not growing properly. Our, our, our per capita income is, is low compared to our peers. I mean, by a lot of measures, we're not doing well. Now, you can't blame it all on the politicians, but you can lay some of it at the feet of the politicians. Our, our forms of government here are, are counterproductive to, to a developing and prosperous community like Destin and Gulf Shores on either side. It's like, wait just a second. Now, why is this such a disaster? It's a disaster because we have over-governmentalized the community. We have the DID, a useless and senseless and hopefully soon defunct organization. That's a government. We have the CRA. It's a kind of a government. We, we have the, the ECUA. ECUA. We, one of the few places in the world where you have a government over a sewer, okay? I mean, this is this is the kind of stuff we do. For years, we had two clerks here. We have the Santa Rosa Island Authority. You know, why don't we have the Cantonment Authority? I mean, we have so many governments, and they step on each other. They overlap each other. The city of Pensacola ought to govern the city of Pensacola, and all of this, the CRA should be abolished. I mean, there's no longer yeah. a need for we, the CRA. We, we thought we were making some progress. I mean, I, it, it, it looked like the Downtown Improvement Board spends 70% of the money it collects from extra taxes on itself. It, it doesn't make any sense. And I thought there was there was yeah. some movement toward abolishing it, but now there's, we're going to have some more studies and well, some more... Well, they'll talk and talk about tippy it. tippy around. But the truth is... There's 400,000 bucks there. Now, here's something that some of you folks don't know. You don't even know where the DIB is, and I'm not sure our staff is able to put up this map because we are working on that. If you can, good. If, you, if not, we'll work on it next, next time around. But if you live in the DIB area, it's not just businesses. People say, well, that's all for businesses. Wrong Ola. This geographical area has lots of residences. Everybody who's a resident that lives within this geographical area pays 40% more city taxes. Yeah. 40% more city taxes. You pay two extra mil. Your city tax rate is 4.5 mils. You pay two more. You pay 6.5. So you are paying an enormously high tax burden because you happen to be in the geographical location of the, quote, downtown business whatever, okay? <laughs> the DIB, the downtown improvement, whatever it is. This district isn't just businesses. Now, businesses want to tax themselves, fine, but when the public really gets tuned into this bill, that they're paying this big tax burden and they get no benefit, <laughs> no benefit from it at all. I think people are going to say, you better, you better spend this money wisely and you better do it pretty fast because we can, there is a mechanism where you can petition the city council to put this on the ballot, I mean, to, to present this to the legislature and do away with the downtown improvement board altogether. That might happen. Oh, I hope so. And that might happen. Yeah. Um, because right now we have $400,000 a year that could be used to improve <coughs> down, downtown as, as opposed to staffing, yeah. okay? Well, we have covered a lot, and uh, next week we'll have to we'll try to have the maps. These maps uh, we're going to try to have is a DIB map show you where everybody is in the DIB, the CRA map show everybody where the CRA is, and then to show what the city of Pensacola is. Okay. Good idea. Yeah, and right. we'll, we'll overlap them and see where we are. All right, you got anything else? Thank no, is there any more time? I've always there's got it. <laughs> there's, there's, I got the last word tonight. Go All right, that, that's it. Uh, we're finished. Good night. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching Within Reason.
For over 30 years, we've had the privilege to live and work in this great community. Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, representing accident victims across Northwest Florida. 